Zoom. Okay, yeah, uh, assistant professor in the history department, specializing in East Asian history. Um, she comes to us uh, from Georgetown, uh, origin originally from Canada, um, and then somehow um, ended up at Georgetown from Canada after doing her all her schooling uh, in Canada before Georgetown. PhD in uh, 2015 on the conundrum of collaboration, Sino-Muslims and the Japanese Empire in China, 1931 to 1945. Um, working in both Japanese and Chinese, which I think impresses all of us um, that she's got both those languages under her belt, plus some European ones besides English. She has published uh, a number of book chapters and refereed articles, and um, in a, just a few short years has gotten uh, what I think is an ungodly number of research fellowships and postdocs, all of them quite prestigious. Her book has just come out, called China, China, excuse me, China's Muslims and Japan's Empire, Centering Islam in World War II, out from University of North Carolina Press. Um, she teaches, among other things, a very popular class on World War II in the Pacific. And uh, finally, I think that she might be best known around town for her animal companion, a corgi named Dino. So if you see him or hear barking um, today, uh, behind her or from her lap, that's, uh, that's Dino. And uh, without further ado, I'm gonna turn my, uh, myself off and monitor the chat and uh, introduce to you Kelly Hammond. Thank you all for coming. So everyone wants to see Dino. Dino, do you wanna go on the Zoom chat? Come here, come. He, he's a little shy, there he is. No, he wants to hide on his bed right now. <laughs> Um, so let me just share my screen and get my PowerPoint up and hopefully you guys will also be able to see me um, while I'm doing this. Okay, so today I'd like to talk to you about something I'm working on called uh, Cold War Mosque, Islam Politics and the Taipei Grand Mosque. But before I start, I also need to thank um, Nani Verzon and Dr. Ted Swedenberg for number one, inviting me to do this talk and also for um, supporting my research over the past number of years, as well as for um, Nani's incredible organizational and uh, organizational skills, which I will not give any credit to uh, Dr. Swedenberg for that. It's all Nani in that regard. Um, I also would like to thank um, our sponsors tonight. Um, who beyond the Middle East Studies program are history, um, Asian studies, international and global studies and religious studies. And I think that, that you know, the, the breadth of the people or, the, or the, the, the breadth of the sort of groups that are sponsoring this talk really sort of speaks to how I'm trying to position myself as really a, a, a global historian or a world historian. Um, and finally, I have a little plug for anyone who is a, either an upper level undergraduate or a, a, new, a, a graduate student. In the spring semester, I will be teaching a course called Islam in Asia, which I have taught before. So if you're interested in learning more about um, sort of the manifestations of the way Islam is practiced throughout history in Southeast Asia, as well as in East Asia, um, look for that course in the fall. It's I'm sorry, in the spring 2021. Um, so I'm just going to get started now. So actually, my book is actually coming out in November 2020. You can pre-order it now from the University of North Carolina website or on Amazon, but um, it's, it's coming out soon. So what I would like to do here today is to briefly talk about my forthcoming book and then um, to talk about the construction of the Thai, uh, and opening of the Taipei Grand Mosque, which started in 1958, as a way to sort of bridge some of the questions I was thinking about in my first book and how those are going to sort of morph into my second project. Um, this talk is part of a journal article that I recently um, had accepted for publication. Um, after I do all the revisions that are needed. Um, and it's sort of like a springboard for what I'm imagining to be my second project, which is tentatively titled Islam and Politics in the East Asian Cold War. So although still broadly conceived, I plan on examining the ways that post-occupation Japan 
uh, the nationalist government in the Republic of China and communist China and the Communist Party in the People's Republic of China jockeyed for the loyalty and support of Muslims in their own states and through their diplomatic engagement with new post-colonial Muslim states from Algeria to Yemen in the first decades of the Cold War. So before I start, I would like to make it clear who I am talking about. The majority of the actors in my narratives are Chinese Muslims. Um, who are sometimes called Sino-Muslims and who are designated by the state as a group called the Hui or the Huizu or Huimin. Um, these people are mostly descendants of Central Asian bureaucrats who were brought by Kublai Khan um, during the Mongol Yuan dynasty to serve as bureaucrats, so around in the 13th century. And what they did was they intermarried with Han Chinese women, but they retained their faith in Islam. So, they speak Chinese as their primary language, so I don't speak Uyghur, I don't speak Kazakh, I don't, um, I, you know, Chinese and Japanese are my primary research languages. And this group of people is distinguished from other Central Asian Muslim communities that now find themselves living within the boundaries of the People's Republic of China, like the Uyghurs, the Kyrgyz, the Kazakhs, the Tajiks, the Uzbeks, and so on. Um, that, being said, I'm happy to field any questions about the current situation in Xinjiang uh, regarding the unlawful detention and incarceration of Uyghurs and Kazakhs and other uh, Muslim minorities in that region after uh, in the Q&A. So my first book is a transnational history of World War II and it places Muslims from China at the center of Imperial Japan's challenges to Chinese nation building efforts during the war. The book uncovers little known history of Japan's interest in Islam during the occupation of North China. And I show how the one of the ways that Imperial Japan aimed to defeat the Chinese nationalists was by winning the hearts and minds of Muslims throughout China's vast borderlands. These efforts were then extended beyond the mainland into other places in Southeast Asia, in East Asia and Southeast Asia. Offering programs that presented themselves as the protectors of Islam, the Japanese provided Muslims with a viable alternative to subvert the existing capitalist global world order and to destabilize the Soviet Union. At the same time, the Japanese were attempting to create new Muslim consumer markets that could disrupt and displace Western markets. So this is the sort of fascist third way. Um, in the book, I argue that their wartime experience ultimately helped shape the formation of Sino-Muslim religious identities within larger global Islamic networks and the path to their incorporation into the Chinese state, where the conditions um, of that incorporation remain unstable and contested to this day. So these, these are two pictures that actually appear in my book, and they were both taken by uh, members of the Japanese, Muslim, uh, the Japanese Islamic Association. The one that's in this shrine, this was taken at the Meiji Jingu, or the Meiji Shrine, which is in the Harajuku district of Tokyo. And this is a visit in 1938 of members of the Chinese Muslim Association to Tokyo. So I'm sort of curious about how these Muslim interlocutors understood Japanese imperial space through their visits um, to, you know, to the wartime capital. And then this other picture of these three young men studying, these are not actually Chinese Muslims. Um, this picture was taken in 1943, and these are Filipino Muslims. So the majority of the Philippines is Roman Catholic because it was uh, a, a Spanish colony until it was lost to the Americans um, in the Spanish-American War. Um, but in, this, in, in the southern part of the Philippine archipelago, they're closer to Borneo and the Sultanate of Brunei. There are large uh, populations that resisted conversion to Catholicism. And so the Japanese were recruiting these young men. These young men were in um, Tokyo to uh, study Japanese and also to study to become police officers. So they were planning to you know, study in Tokyo for a number of years and then be deployed back to the place that they came from uh, in the Philippines. So now I wanna sort of connect this to some of the aims of my second project. Um, in my second project, I would like to explore continuities across the World War II and Cold War divide by showcasing how events like the World Muslim Congress held in Karachi in 1951 
or even the non-aligned conference in Bandung in 1956 would not have been possible without connections made by Muslims during World War II throughout Asia and the Middle East. I also want to continue to decenter the US and the Soviets as the only active agents in the East Asian Cold War, focusing on Muslims who were from or living in post-occupation Japan, nationalist Taiwan, or communist China helps recast these people as individuals playing an important role in shaping an East Asian future rather than as passive agents in a bipolar world. So um, this book here on the, um, the far left, Migration in the Time of Revolution by Joe Taomo, I, I loved this book. It was fab, I actually wrote a review of it. Um, and really what she's doing is she's exploring the lives of ethnic Chinese who had made Indonesia their home and the sort of um, vacillation of their everyday experience in the 50s and 60s as the sort of the larger geopolitical climate in East Asia um, changed and Southeast Asia changed throughout, um, you know, the, the, this tumultuous post-colonial moment in the region. But, you know, the, this whole book doesn't really address the question of Islam and the fact that um, Indonesia is the, the nation state with the largest population of Muslims is something that I think is an important thing to address. I, I don't want to critique her for like not doing something that wasn't part of her original goal when she set out to write this book. But I think what it does is it allows me like a space of entry. And so in this field of new Cold War history, I see a space for the stories that I am trying to tell. Also um, in the historiography of the Cold War in East Asia, um, generally we associate 1958 with a very tense moment known as the second Taiwan Straits crisis. Um, during this time, the People's Republic of China was shelling small islands which belonged to Taiwan as a test to see how far they could push the Americans who were in a defensive treaty with the nationalist government. So although not quite as tense as the Bay of Pigs, um, this was a serious escalation in Cold War politics in East Asia that could have potentially drawn the U.S. into another war in the Pacific shortly after the Korean War had ended in a stalemate. But 1958 was also the year that the ground was broken on the Taipei Grand Mosque and Muslims who had helped raise the funds had made this project come to fruition during this tense time. So I think by examining the opening of the mosque, it allows us to tell stories beyond the sort of um, simple Cold War narratives, uh, or we can tell sort of new stories about Cold War narratives. Okay, so with that in mind, let's turn our attention to the actual construction and building of the mosque. Um, soon after the Chinese nationalists started their retreat to Taiwan, after their defeat by the Chinese communists in the Chinese Civil War, they enlisted the services of longtime Sino-Muslim ally, General Bai Chongxi, to lead up the Chinese Muslim Association on the island. And high on his agenda were sort of plans to get, um, uh, to, to get funds to sort of start building this mosque. Um, Bai was an eager and valuable international diplomat for the nationalist government with connections to Muslims around the world. He had fought against the, Chap the Japanese and the communists on the Chinese mainland before joining the 20,000 or so other Muslims who made the difficult decision to retreat with the nationalist government to Taiwan. Um, Bai is also very important in the history of modern China because in uh, 1927 he is the man that orchestrated the purge of the Communist Party that took place in Shanghai, effectively ending the first united front and essentially decapitating the Chinese Communist Party as urban labor organizers. What this did was it allowed a space for Mao who was actually not in Shanghai at the time when all of these party leaders were purged to um, sort of rise to the top and present his new, you know, he was, when this purge happened, he was actually out in the countryside writing um, his treatise about peasant revolution. So I think that it, you know, Bai plays an important role in 20th century Chinese politics um, dating back to the early 1920s. I argue that the Taipei Grand Mosque was partially built as a political gesture. 
It was meant to be a site of international exchange where Muslims with like-minded political inclinations from around the world could participate in cultural and diplomatic missions that were meant to help the nationalist government in exile take back the Chinese mainland. When we think of mosques, we generally think of them as ritual spaces of worship. However, in this case, the Chinese nationalists and the Chinese Muslim Association had overtly political intentions when they started making plans to build the mosque. When sacred spaces are politicized, the value of the physical space goes far beyond the mosque as a space of worship for an individual community of believers. It becomes a symbol. And in this case, the mosque was envisioned and presented as an anti-communist stronghold and was meant to help the Chinese nationalists raise support from like-minded anti-communist Muslims from around the world. The members of the Chinese Muslim Association were active players in Cold War politics, and they were able to connect with their Muslim brethren around the world in ways that their non-nationalist -mus non Muslim political allies were not able to do. When the government welcomed Muslim dignitaries like King Faisal of Saudi Arabia to Taiwan, their first stop was generally the Taipei Grand Mosque. So in this image here, you can see uh, King Faisal visiting with Chiang Kai-shek, and there he is again walking around with Madame Chiang Kai-shek. But you can see um, on the side, there's this diplomat, this man who's a diplomat, and this is Ding Zhongming. And he um, actually was the second or third imam of the Taipei Grand Mosque, but he was actually removed from his position as um, imam and sent as a diplomat. And he worked as a career diplomat throughout the Middle East in the 60s, 70s, and into the 80s. And then when he retired, he um, retained, re-entered re um, the mosque as an imam or uh, in some sort of position of authority. Now, he was used, um, the, the nationalists needed him as a, as a, uh, diplomat because he had actually studied at Al-Azhar and he was fluent in Arabic. And this is um, a long tradition of relationships between the Chinese, national, Chinese nationalists and Chinese students, that's Chinese Muslim students that study at Al-Azhar. Um, so I, and there is a very long tradition of Azarites being um, imams at the Taipei Mosque. I think the first non-Azarite to be an imam started the position in like 2006 or 2007. So these are like deep and long connections that go back to the 1920s. So when the, um, when the Taipei, when the building of the, Mo wait, when the building of the Taipei Grand Mosque is framed as a political project, these outreach efforts by the Chinese Muslim Association start to make more sense. By bringing attention to a certain segment of the Muslim community, who were deeply opposed to the communist oppression of religion and treatment of Muslims on the Chinese mainland, we also begin to see alternative visions for a Chinese Muslim future, um, as articulated by Chinese Muslims themselves. Men like Bai Chongxi and uh, Ding Zhongming were active brokers in expressing their own visions for a Sino-Muslim future. There, um, this helps reinforce an important point that Muslims in China were not only diverse in their religious beliefs, but in their political ones as well. So construction on the mosque started in 1958. A few years prior, um, the Taipei Mosque Construction Committee began collecting funds to build a mosque that would hold 600 worshipers. After securing a loan um, to cover two thirds of the cost of the building of the mosque from the National Bank of China, the committee managed to raise the last third of the money from uh, Muslim VIPs or Islam Guibin around the world. Among those who made donations to the mosque building project were King Saud of Saudi Arabia, Mohammad Reza, the Shah of Iran, King Hussein of Jordan, and Prince Abdullah of Iraq. So, but why? Why did Taipei so desperately need a mosque? And why did it become a priority to raise funds for the construction of a mosque from other anti-communist supporters in the so-called quote unquote Muslim world? This micro history of the building and opening of the Taipei Mosque sheds light on the new post-World post War II world order in East Asia and on how the Chinese nationalists quickly started looking for allies beyond the United States in their fight to retake the mainland. In this mid-year, the Chinese nationalists politicized Islam as a way to create or maintain 
economic, political, and cultural relationships in a world that was supposedly simply divided into pro-communist and anti-communist camps. Fostering was also a continuation of wartime policies and was meant to foster diplomatic engagement with newly formed post-colonial states. These were tried and true policies implemented by hardened political operatives geared at Muslims and Muslim governments around the world. So the story of Islam in Taiwan does not really start until the 1940s. There were itinerant Muslim travel, Muslim traders who were part of the maritime Qing, the Manchu Qing maritime sphere. But as far as an Islam past, it is hard for those now living in Taiwan to make any claims to one. From the Mongol Yuan dynasty, Trenzhou, which I've located on the map here in Fujian province, developed into a large maritime trading enclave um, with a number of important Muslim lineages. Then, in the 1660s, Muslim soldiers played an important role in the Qing capture of Formosa, which was the name of the island of Taiwan from the Dutch. So um, Formosa had come under Dutch control, and this was seen as a threat to the Qing maritime sphere. So they sent, they sent um, an, an, an army to invade and kick the Dutch out. In 1725, Muslims do, uh, dug a well for holy water, and erected what is believed to be the first mosque in Taiwan. At the time, the Qing census registered around 600 Muslim households living on the island. However, this number slowly dwindled as Muslim women intermarried with non-Muslim men and Muslim migrants stopped coming from the mainland. By the time that the nationalists retreated to the island over 200 years later, there were only a handful of Muslims living there most of whom were traders who tra traveled around the South China Seas and used the island as a home base. But in the aftermath of the Chinese nationalist defeat, um, somewhere around 20,000 nationalists supported Chinese Muslims and Uyghurs retreated to the island, the majority of whom were urban elites and political with political connections and clout, such as military officers, high-ranking civil servants, and professors. So um, I just want to make it clear that after the People's Liberation Army entered into Xinjiang province or East Turkestan um, and occupied East Turkestan, they, a number of waves of migrants left. The majority of them either traveled through, um, out through Nepal and into India. A number of them made their way to Pakistan. And from there, they either decided whether they would join the nationalist government in Taiwan um, and a number of Uyghur communities actually, and Chinese Muslim communities that did not want to make that decision to move to nationalist Taiwan, um, moved to Jeddah. So there's a large uh, community of diasporic Uyghurs and Chinese Muslims in Jeddah. And a number of them also moved to Istanbul. So uh, 1950, we sort of see a large wave of people leaving as the communists, the, the People's Liberation Army enters into Xinjiang province. Um, however, a number of influential Uyghurs did um, move to Taiwan, and one of them is a very interesting character who I'm happy to talk more about in the Q&A, named Yolbers Khan, um, and he was a sort of hardened military operative, not a great diplomat, but sort of useful for the Chinese nationalists in their posturing um, in their Cold War politics. Okay. So architecturally, the mosque is rather unique. It blends styles from China, the Ottoman Empire, the Arabian Peninsula, and Central Asia. The architect is a man named Yang Chocheng, or in Chinese, Mandarin Chinese, Yang Guocheng. And he is one of the most famous architects in the Republic of China, from the Republic of China. He actually died in California in around 2008. Although not a Muslim himself, he was responsible for designing many of the state-sponsored projects in Taiwan, um, which are very important in the sort of cultural landscape of uh, especially the capital city of Taipei. So he is most well known for designing the Taipei Grand Hotel, as well as the National Theater and the National, National Concert Halls, which um, flank the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial. So this is um, a large memorial to Chiang Kai-shek and the National Library of Taiwan is behind it. And then on the left and the right, we have an opera hall and a, a concert hall. 
Um, he also designed uh, Chiang Kai-shek's official residence named Shirlin. And he also designed um, these important buildings, this important central bank of the Republic of China. So these buildings make up the most well-known political and cultural landmarks of the city. So it, apart from the, um, the Chiang Kai-shek Memorial, which was obviously developed in the 80s after Chiang Kai-shek passed away, all of these other state-sponsored projects were being built at the same time. And the fact that they, you know, the nationalist government chose um, this one person to sort of design them, I think is a testament to sort of the nation building efforts and the importance of this mosque in the creation or the sort of recreation or re-envisionment of an ethno-national um, Chinese nationalist uh, vision for a Chinese future. So construction on the mosque began in 1958 and it took around 18 months to complete. The plan was to build a mosque that met international standards and that would be appealing to Muslim exiles. Yang, who is best known for his Chinese style architecture, had never designed a mosque before. This is perhaps why some people call it a stylistic mashup, which consists of Chinese, Ottoman, and Arabic, as well as um, eclectic Central Asian styles. Um, it also features this Romanesque um, style arched corridor that goes around the perimeter, which I personally have never seen on a mosque in East Asia, and I've read is extremely rare for mosques in East Asia. Oops. So the opening cere ceremony, ooh. okay, yeah, the opening ceremonies uh, surrounding the Taipei Grand Mosque took place between April 13th and April 16th, 1960. Listed here are just some of the Muslim dignitaries who were invited to the island for the three-day celebration. So obviously the Muslims that, they were not simply in Taiwan for, to attend the opening of the, inaug the inaugural prayers at the opening of the mosque. After attending the opening ceremonies early Wednesday morning, the group's schedules were full for the next three days. While in Taipei, they called on the vice president of the Republic of China, Chen Cheng. They also stopped in for a visit with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, the Minister of the Interior, before having guest uh, dinner at the government guest house with a number of government officials. Later the same evening, the Chinese Muslim Association organized a meeting with the representatives from Brunei, the Philippines, and Japan to discuss the different ways that they could coordinate to support religious freedom promote cultural and economic ties and condemn communism among the quote unquote free countries in East and Southeast Asia. Oops, wrong way. The following day, they visited a land reform and rural reconstruction project, the Shemin Dam, which is still there, and the Yulong Motor Factories, which still makes cars under contract for Nissan. After touring the factory, the group had dinner, um, ha had a dinner hosted by the Minister of the Interior. On Friday, the group took a flight to Kaohsiung, where they visited the Taiwan aluminum plant, the Kaohsiung Plastic Works, and the Tainan Cement Factory. The tour ended with a farewell dinner at the Kaohsiung Grand Hotel, which was also designed by Young. In these three days, the political, the economic, and the religious inter all intermingled. As Muslim dignitaries were taken to see the best of what Taiwan had to offer, they were intent on building and supporting anti-communist alliances through outreach that started at the Taipei Grand Mosque. So in this last short section of my talk, I would just like to briefly outline two, um, to, to introduce two outreach efforts by the Chinese Muslim Association in the 1950s and 1960s as part of their ongoing efforts to combat communism in East Asia and Southeast Asia. When North Korea invaded South Korea with Chinese and Soviet backing, the Cold War heated up quickly in the region. In August 1950, the Chinese Muslim Youth League for Anti-Communism and Chinese Reconstruction sent a letter of support to Tashin Yezuji, the Brigadier General of the, command of the, of the Turkish Armed Forces Command in Korea. According to the letter, by joining the UN coalition, the Turks had joined the quote unquote, democracy loving countries to defeat the North Korean puppets of the Soviets. 
The League pointed out that even though Turkey and Taiwan were geographically distant from each other, they were connected by Islam and their mutual desire to rid the world of communism. After Indonesia gained its independence from the Dutch, the first prime minister, Sukarno, began accepting aid from the Chinese communists and the Soviets. In 1967, in an incredibly violent and bloody coup, US-backed Suharto seized power and massacred upwards of a million communist and socialist throughout Indonesia. As far as the Chinese Muslim Association was concerned, the anti-communist uprisings led by Muslims against Sukarno served two purposes. Firstly, they allowed the Chinese Muslim Association to offer support to anti-communist crusaders in Southeast Asia. And secondly, it gave the organization the political ammo to they needed to continue advocating to increase support to Muslims living under communist oppression on the mainland. To mark the occasion of the coup, the Chinese Muslim Association sent, him a sent Suharto a telegram congratulating him on assuming political power in Indonesia and sending him best wishes in his continued success in the fight against communism. So to conclude, I would like to offer some insights into the changing meaning of space at the Taipei Grand Mosque as a way to show how Islam and Islamic practices continue to transform dramatically in Taiwan in the post-Cold War era. The idea for this project came about a number of years ago when I spent the summer in Taiwan as a fellow at the Center for Chinese Studies. I found all kinds of fabulous and relevant archival materials, some of which I have presented here today, but I was really fascinated with the mosque itself. One of the things that struck me was that the Taipei Grand Mosque is now in essence a woman's mosque because it serves the young, single, Malaysian and Indonesian caregivers who sojourn there. In the hierarchy of women's migrant labor in the Pacific, Malay and Indonesian caregivers are less sought out than English speaking Filipinos. As Filipino caregivers make their way to Hong Kong, Singapore, Australia, Canada, and the United States to work in the homes of upper middle class families, the English speaking care, oh, um, Muslim, Malay, and Indonesians generally head to Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan, where having an English speaking caregiver is less valued unless you are very wealthy. If you visit the mosque on a Friday afternoon, the space is full of women from Southeast Asia in their brightly colored headscarves milling about selling snacks to passersby. The halal market is a testament to the vibrant and growing community of Muslims making Taiwan their temporary and permanent homes. Um, you'll often find, um, you know, it, Burmese rice bowls, all of the halal food, you know, different kinds of halal food, um, Lebanese cuisine, Indonesian, Malay, it's great. So if you're ever in Taiwan, you should make this um, a priority for a Friday afternoon. Um, there's also a really large halal food court in the Taipei train station, which is definitely worth a visit if you ever have the opportunity. In 2007, with the support of the Chinese Muslim Association, the Taiwanese government started the process of getting halal accreditation for food processing plants and certain hotels throughout the island. Between 2011 and 2018, more than 100 com companies and restaurants received halal accreditation. There are now a total of eight mosques on the island of Taiwan. Two, the two most recently built which are in smaller cities and built within the past 10 years, are built entirely with Indonesian money. As the government and the Chinese Muslim Association continues to promote connections with Muslims, and as the People's Republic of China takes an increasingly hard line against Islam, perhaps Taiwan's engagement and outreach to Muslims around the world will continue to flourish. And now you'll have an idea about how some of these diplomatic connections have started. So thank you very much. I'm gonna end my slideshow and I'm hoping that you guys have some questions for me. Um, so, hi. So if anyone has any questions, I think either, I don't know if anyone put anything in the chat. I'm trying to look at it, but. So we don't have anything in the chat. Um, Not yet, but 
Okay. But if you would like to ask a question, you can also uh, raise your hand and I will unmute you or feel free to go ahead and put something in the chat and we'll call on you. In the meantime, while people are thinking of questions, um, could you talk about like, so did you have access to the Chinese Muslim Association archives? Uh, um, just, like, uh, so, um, you know, because you showed a document from them. So I was just wondering what the source was. Uh, yeah, so those are actually from the Taiwanese Foreign Ministry archives. Ah, uh, okay. And they have um, a large collection of folders that dealing with international relations having to do with the, what some of the outreach the Chinese Muslim Association was doing. So um, I've also been to the mosque archives, but they don't really have that much stuff. And mm -hmm. so they mostly just have like religious texts, which I mean, might be valuable for someone else's project, but aren't really specifically what I'm looking for. Um, they did also produce a periodical that I'm trying to track down, which is elusive. Thanks. Oh, we got a, we got a hand from uh, William. Oh. Who you might know. You want to put on your, know. yeah. Hi, William. Hi, hi, Dr. Hammond. Um, so I have a, a question. Um, basically, so it seems as if the um, Muslims in Taiwan were kind of using a very flexible approach to approach like transnational um, like donors and transnational support. Right. Um, is this something that, I mean, do you think that that is something that was contributing to, to why it was so political that they built the mosque? And is this something that is very typical across like, like other types of efforts at like transnational support when it comes to, to mosques and, and religions that are mostly like a minority for lack of a better term um, in these contexts? Yeah, hmm. I mean, that is, a, a good question and something I, in other contexts I would have to look more into. But I, I think one of the points that I'm, I'm really gonna try to make in this work, which I'm still trying to flesh out, is that the, these networks that these Chinese Muslims were creating um, go back to like the 1920s and 1930s and they were actively sort of seeking out connections to you know, to, to different people in different spaces. And I think that that does have to do with the fact that they were minorities within the People's Republic of China. So they had, or within the, the Republic of China. And so they had a sort of fluidity to their identity where they could either, you know, enhance their Chineseness or enhance their Muslimness, for lack of a better term. And I think that that's what really what made them valuable in sort of creating these networks throughout um, with Muslims around the world. I don't know if that really answers your question, but it, it would be, you know, someone, um, one of the reviewers on my article uh, talking about this construction of the Cold War mosque mentioned to me that I should look into the construction of the first mosque in Washington, DC, which actually happened in 1945, right after the Second World War, and was actually also a government funded project um, so that is something that I'm curious to sort of look into a little bit more. We have a question on chat um, from Victoria Savage. Okay. Does the Muslim community in Taiwan have any involvement with separatist movements such as ETIM in Xinjiang and how? Uh, so the indigenous Muslim community in Taiwan right now is actually quite small. I would say the majority of the people that are Muslims living in Taiwan are uh, migrants to the island. Um, and whether or not they have any political inclinations to support the Uyghurs is something that I would imagine is not high on their political agenda as, um, as people that are, however, I'm not really sure if individuals are interested in supporting, supporting that. Um, I guess, you know, my, my, my view, my, my stance would be that most of the migrants that live in Taiwan right now might have their own personal views on certain things, but they would not 
publicly voice those because it could in some way engender or endanger their visas. Speaking of visas though, one of the interesting things about Taiwan is that they also send hajis um, to, on the hajj and a lot of um, Indonesians actually go to Taiwan for a year or two because it's actually the quota for them to get a hajj visa is much lower so they have a higher chance than getting a hajj visa from Indonesia. So if they want to go on hajj, um, some of them will go work in Taiwan for a number of years, save up money and then take the trip from Taiwan. So there are Hodge organizations that, or Hodge tourist groups that organize there. Other questions for Dr. Hammond? And, and uh, while we're waiting, I want to say that we have people from outside of Arkansas on here, including I know at least one person in Canada that is, uh, that is watching. Oh, here's a question. OK, um, from Gail Mugill. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that. You mentioned that the Taipei Grand Mosque is now known as a women's mosque. Mm -hmm. Did the mosque always allow women to worship there? The, there would have been a women's section in the mosque and there still is. If you, if you looked at the picture that I showed, um, so the mainland in China is the only place in the world that I'm aware of that where women can become imams and they're specifically women's mosques. I do not know of anywhere else in the world where that is possible. Um, so I think that there is a certain level of flexibility and fluidity um, in terms of the, the gendered aspect of this mosque that comes from a sort of different understanding or different way of sort of presenting gender in terms of its relation to Islam. So is there a place, has there always been a place for women to pray in the mosque? Yes. Is there still a place for women to pray in the mosque? Yes. Is it bigger than it was in the past? Yes. Um, do they have their own? They also now have um, their own worship times that are separate from men's worship times because there's so many um, Muslim women that are living in Taiwan uh, apart from their um, apart from their families. And so this is really where they form their community away from their homes. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank other, you, that's a great question. Yeah. Other, uh, other takers, other questions? Dr. Hammond doesn't have to be anywhere for about 10 minutes, so <laughs> we, you've got um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to answer any questions. So she's happy to answer, answer answer any other questions. Yeah, if anyone has questions about Xinjiang or. Uh, okay, here we go. This is from some some dean at the University of Arkansas. I'm not oh, sure. Who. What's with the Romanesque architectural form? Yeah, I think that's just some like. I think that the architect probably just looked at some pictures of mosques from around the world and just kind of like threw in whatever he thought looked good and kind of put it all together. I'm not really sure what his intent was, but it's definitely um, something that's common in, uh, not common in mosques that around um, Southeast Asia and East Asia, but it makes for this like really great space. You can sit out of the shade and sort of walk around the corridor. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the intent was, but I think that it just sort of shows his unfamiliarity with mosques and probably his desire to sort of take what he liked best from different mosques that he saw around the world and sort of like put it all together in this weird style. Great. We have another one. During the Cold War, did the United States play any role, supporting role in these events, the building of the Taipei Mosque or specific support to these anti-communists, but I guess it means the Muslim anti-communists. Did our support, if any, end with 9-11 or was it earlier or later? Did, wait, did the support end with 9-11? Yeah, for the, for the, for, I'm, I'm guessing the, um, <laughs> whatever role it was playing with Muslims before 9-11, so. Um. Well, I so haven't that, actually, okay, so, so the first question about US support, I haven't seen anything in the Chinese archives or in any sources in Chinese about US support 
but I also haven't visited any of like the CIA archives or anything like that. I, I did use um, OSS archives for my first project and the, the Chinese, the Americans were very well aware of what was going on within Muslim communities in uh, China and in the Soviet borderlands. So I would, I would imagine that this um, continued. I mean, people like Edgar Snow, who wrote Red Star Over China, had spent a lot of time. He even he has a whole chapter in that book about Muslims and Islam, and then he was sort of purged in the McCarthy trials in the 50s. So I'm, I'm, I'm quite positive that if I go and spend some time in both of the FBI archives that are looking at some of these so-called, you know, communists who spent time in China, as well as in, in the CIA archives, and maybe even in, um, I'm not exactly sure where else I would look, maybe in the Hoover, at the Hoover Institute, where they have all the Chiang Kai-shek papers, as well as um, a number of papers from people in, that spend a lot of time in nationalist China, I might uncover some connections to the United States. But as to any evidence of that in the Chinese, um, it seems uh, that there, I haven't seen any evidence of it, at overt support. Just for those uh, people who don't, I mean, don't know or don't have as much knowledge of the deep state OSS, um, that oh. was, it's the forerunner of the CIA. Right? Yeah, Office oh. of Strategic Services, sorry. That's okay. Um, okay, another question. Um, are there any ethical concerns about using religious points in the community such as mosques as tools for political gain? From my perspective? Uh, um, un unclear. <laughs> I don't really know how to answer that question. Uh, but maybe, maybe within the, maybe are there any Muslims who have a problem with that? Maybe that would be the question. I don't know. They're okay. They're yeah, okay. I mean, yeah. I don't know how to answer that. I don't, I just, I'm just a historian. I don't really delve into the, the ethics of religiosity. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to tell a story about like how I see the mosque being politicized. Um, whether or not these were individual concerns of people, I, I really can't say without, you know, having their own personal papers or... Okay. I mean, all religious spaces are politicized in some way or another. If you look at what's happening in Turkey with the Hagia Sophia, you know, it's gone from being a... It's gone from being a church to a mosque and back to a now uh, then to a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and now back to being uh, an active mosque. And this is something that Erdogan has been promoting for, you know, since he came to power. So I don't, I don't really think ever religious spaces are places where politics don't play out, if, if, I mean, if that's what the, the, the question is. Um, next question. Um, I have read that the CIA supported separatist movements in Xinjiang prior to 2001. Is this true? And what is the CIA involvement now with any militant or non-militant groups? Who asked that question? This is Victoria Savage. Um, I have not. Well, I mean, the CIA was active in subverting communism anywhere it could prior to, you know, prior to the end of the Cold War. Um, I personally do not know of any connections to the CIA. So I can't really speak to that. I'm not an American political science, I'm not an American historian, and that those aren't really things that I focus my work on. Um, did 2001 provide the Chinese government, did November, uh, no, September 11th, provide the Chinese government with new tools and new rhetoric to crack down on the Uyghurs and increasingly sort of subvert uh, or increasingly bring it them under their political control? Absolutely. Um, how active was the CIA in Xinjiang before 2001? I don't know because yeah, just not really something that's been on my uh, research or radar. 
Dr. Sexton asks, I think it's unusual for mosques to have porticos facing public space, streets. Is this common in mainland China? Uh, Dr. Sexton, can you, what's the portico, what's a portico? <laughs> <laughs> Like the, the opening. Am I unmuted? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, all the arcades, I think like where you showed people eating and things, uh, the arcades that are on the front of the building. So I'm usually, usually used to seeing them on the interior around a courtyard. Yeah. Uh, that's what I mean. Yeah. I mean, those, those arcades are like, n I've never even seen those at all in mo on mosques in East Asia. I think they're very, very uncommon. So the fact that they're on the outside, I don't know what the intent of the architect was. I think it's just his really, really, I think it reflects his unfamiliarity with mosque construction and um, like how Islamic space in the mosque is supposed to work. Um, and so is it common in East Asia? No, absolutely not. I've never really seen it before anywhere else. Victoria Savage said, thank you. That is interesting about how 9-11 affected China's involvement in Xinjiang. So just not a question. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think that the, the, the global war on terror really provided the Chinese government with the, the, rhetor the rhetoric that it needed to make the Uyghurs look like terrorists. And that is increasingly, you know, and then, you know, when a number of them were arrested in Afghanistan and then sent to Guantanamo, that created the sort of buzz in China that they needed to sort of begin their vilification and the sort of transformation of Uyghurs from this um, ethnic minority into this group of religious terrorists that needed to be sort of suppressed. And then that, that, that rhetoric has now evolved, obviously, um, into a different sort of set of discourses, but that's really how I think that that, um, that's sort of how that started. Another question from Gail Mugil. I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name again. What language do imams at the Taipei Grand Mosque use for khutbahs? I've been to mosques in the US that use a mix of English and Arabic. Do they also use multiple languages given the multicultural population of Taiwan? Yeah, the majority of them will be in, um, in Chinese and in Arabic. Um, a lot of, uh, there is a sort of reinvigoration and most of the imams that are there that have, have either studied in like, like Libya or um, in, in Egypt, so they speak fluent Arabic, but um, some of the people that attend the mosque only do recitations in Arabic. So that is new though, until like the 1950s, 1940s or 1930s, the majority of Chinese Muslims would have probably uh, read Persian sources rather than Arabic ones. What about when, what about for the women? When they're for their services? Yeah, no, the, uh, that's a quite. Oh, ooh, I don't know because that would probably be in Arabic and Indonesian. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I don't know though, Ted. I've, yeah. yeah, I haven't been to one so. I could look that up though, because there are people that are doing work and there are anthropologists that are doing work in these communities of um, South East Asian Muslim migrant workers that live in Indonesia. We have time for one more uh, question and I think Dino has to be um, walked and fed probably. Yeah, um, <laughs> he left the room. No yeah. problem, Gail, my pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hammond. That was great. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm really pleased with the turnout and with the, with the great questions everyone asked. And um, we hope to have another event of uh, some sort like this. We don't quite know what it is um, sometime next month. So. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Swedenberg. And thank you, Nanny. It was great for you guys to do this. Um, thanks to my mom for showing up. <laughs> yeah, that was, the, that was the Canada person. There might, be, there might be others, but we know there was at least one. <laughs> yeah, and I really, um, I really enjoyed getting the opportunity to share my new work with you guys. And 
Um, hopefully I'll have a discount code soon for my book where, where it'll be 40% off. So when I get that, I'll share it with um, Dr. Awesome. Spiedenberg and Nani and uh, yeah, yeah, we can get work, get moving on that. So thanks Great. a lot, everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. See everyone uh, in the future. Thanks.